Ladies and gentlemen, if you could put your hands together for Mr. Derek Niebenheim. It's my great honor to be here today, uh, to be amongst uh, all of you who have traveled in from the directions to be here for this important forum. I want to acknowledge the uh, people of Treaty 6, the Saddle Lake, Cree Nation, Chief Betty Maposis and the Council, and of course uh, Cheryl and Peter for putting this great event together. This is uh, visionary work that's happening here, and I'm uh, very honored to be invited to share a few ideas about uh, my involvement and the involvement of, of, of my companies. Um, I want to thank uh, Matt Zakaluzny from BDO who, uh, who drove me out here from, from Edmonton. Uh, he's one of our business partners and I want to thank Cherish Francis as well uh, from, uh, from Nikini, uh, business partner as well for being here and helping uh, you know, coordinate our presence. I'm going to deviate from the script a little bit today in my presentation simply because I think that um, before you can talk about business, you have to start with relationships. Relationship building to me is the, the cornerstone of anything that I venture to do in this world. And in order to strike a good relationship with my friends in Treaty 6, recognizing where I come from, I think is probably most important and how I arrive at this place today it's important to understand who I am and where I come from I think that's how treaties are made and that's how good economic relations are built no matter what area you come from whether you're trying to do business today or 150 years ago there's no way that I would as a Anishinaabe come into into the Nehia territory without trying to establish good relations first. So that's really what my presentation is going to be about, is a little bit about myself. <clears throat> I come from uh, the Minnegoes of the Anishinaabe people, and uh, a lot of our community is uh, situated close to the Catholic Church on the west shore of Lake Winnipeg Moses in, in what's called West Central Manitoba. See, a lot of the families that comprise the uh, Pine Creek First Nation, as it's called today, moved to that location so that they could be close to the kids that were in the residential school in Pine Creek. So a lot of Anishinaabe people from, you know, modern-day Saskatchewan, <coughs> Inner Lake, Manitoba, they moved to that location, and that's kind of how Pine Creek was formed. That, that's a picture of me when I was a little boy on the reserve back in the early 90s. <laughs> No, just kidding, I'm not that young. <laughs> so, late, late 70s. That's my sister Jennifer taking care of me the way she always did. She's a lawyer at the Canadian Human Rights Museum now. But that's how things started for us. We have very humble beginnings as Anishinaabe people coming from the community. And I can tell you the only thing that we're guaranteed when we leave the reserve is our poverty. That's the only thing we were guaranteed when we left. You know, my mom was one of the first ones to leave the reserve and uh, one of the first ones to actually build a little bit of a legacy in the form of a home, building a home for us. You know, I look to my mom for a lot of the inspiration that's gotten me this far in life. I'm also a sun dancer. I sun dance at the uh, Kisikona in the Ojibwe Nation on the Riding Mountain. Um, I know there's other sun dancers and lodge keepers and let you know that ceremony life is, uh, is really what's guided me and helped me get to this point because of the things that I've seen, the trials and tribulations I've experienced as a political leader as a chief in the community, and then as the Grand Chief of the Assembly. Next slide, please. <clears throat> People wonder where our purpose comes from and where our inspiration comes from. You know, yesterday there was a presentation talking about what we need to survive food, shelter, clothing. But I would say that there's something more fundamental than that. And I get this teaching from my friend Paul Chappelle who says there's something more fundamental than food and shelter and clothing, and that is a sense of purpose. A sense of purpose and belonging is more fundamental to your existence than how you adorn yourself. This is my purpose right here. I've got four kids. I've got Rebecca, I've got my son Kiwaitin, my daughter Meadow, my little baby Nidikwe. Nidikwans is what I call her. I called her, uh, named her in the Anishinaabe language because she's part of the revolution. So, 
That's my inspiration, that's my purpose in life. Everything I do is focused on what am I leaving behind for my little ones? And what kind of work am I gonna do today to make sure that I'm leaving something there for my kids? Because times are tough right now. And we're moving into an accelerated climate change phase. And everything we have to do collectively has to focus on how we're gonna assure that we're leaving a good space for our little people to survive. That's really what I focus on now. So am I doing work that's meaningful so that in the, in the next decade or the decade after, we can still have our children going outside and playing outside? Or are we creating a climate where we're not gonna be able to go outside or grow food outside anymore? That's some of the reality we're facing. Leaving Pine Creek, I grew up in different locations and I went to university. Um, a lot of people place a lot of priority on what you learn in school. I've done that as well. But I tried to balance it because I didn't want my identity to be captured in the universities that I went to. So I tried to balance it with what I could learn from the different lodges I've been in throughout my life. And one thing I, I began to work on early in my political career after going to university and you know getting a law degree in Saskatchewan and uh, an undergrad first class BA at U of A, I began to recognize our original jurisdiction. And many of the speakers here have already touched upon original jurisdiction. But this is something that I spoke about, you know, very early on in my tenure as a leader, recognizing that we have treaty-based relationships, and we didn't give away anything in the treaty relationships that we created. But a lot of people think we gave away everything, and they built laws up around our territories to keep us confined within our spaces, and to make us shape our identity around the small geographical reserve that we come from. And I've witnessed that, and I've said, we're more than that. We're the original people here, and we have original freedoms that we never gave away. And that's something that I've always believed in. So I created this little chart to give a sense or an idea as to what I mean by original jurisdiction. It's still true. It's those elements that were silent in treaty. Those elements are the things that we never gave away. And it's only now starting to pick up momentum. It's been mentioned in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as well that we have self-determination and we, we participate freely in the economic, social, and political life of our choosing. From that premise, I recognize that I may not be the ideal Canadian. And I don't mean to be provocative in saying that because I'm not trying to be, but I recognize that most families that came here from other parts of the world swore an allegiance or an oath to be Canadian. But my family didn't because we were already here. You know, there's a lot of families that never swore an oath to the Canadian Citizenship Act, but then we're deemed Canadian just because we're here already. I never did that, and I didn't with my family, so I'm not sure if I'm the perfect Canadian. I like to be because I like our hockey teams. You know? <laughs> Living in Treaty 1, we have the Winnipeg Jets, and there's lots to be pr proud of, you know, from, from what they've been able to do in the last uh, couple of years. But also recognizing that we have original jurisdictions and what are we doing in the Indian Act? And I started to question that because when I was chief back home, we had, we had uh, um, what are they called, funding services officers coming into the community and telling us that we were misspending the funding agreements that we had. And I started to review those funding agreements and they're not agreements, they're not agreements at all and they never were. What they are are documents that are designed to keep us managing our own poverty. So I started to piece that together. That's the economics of it. We manage our own poverty through those agreements, but our economic participation is also limited because we put a lot of energy into trying to work within the, the failure of those documents. And a lot of it ties to the Indian Act. A lot of it ties to the Indian Act. Not only the, the money, but the identity. They've misrepresented us in the Indian Act under Section 6. They started turning us into their statutory Indians. But what if we don't want to be statutory Indians? And what if we don't want somebody in a cubicle in Ottawa telling me who my relations are? We have to figure out how to, how to be who we are outside of this Indian Act system. So I began to carry that message <clears throat> as far and as wide as I could. I started to carry that message because I believe that when we look to people like Bob Marley, for example, 
Some of his lyrics tie very closely to what we're experiencing here. In one of his songs, he says, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves will free our mind. And I found that quote to be very, very pertinent and relative to our own experiences because of what we have inherited, you know, the tragedies and the consequences of living in colonization. We have normalized a lot of our own pain. We've normalized a lot of the bad things that have gone wrong for us. And we venture out into the world becoming entrapped within that Indian Act construct of who we're supposed to be, applying to Ottawa to be a statutory Indian, instead of being okay with being Nihiluk or Anishinaabe or whoever else we are out there. That to me was a starting point. So I jumped on my motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> in 2013, and I drove all through the treaty territory. Some of you might remember that because I came through Saddle Lake. You know, I went through Moscatees. There was five of us riders, and we rode through the treaty territories, and we brought the pipe to the communities, and we talked about treaty, and we left pieces of the treaty fire so that each community could go and have their treaty fire and start talking about what treaty meant. It was about freedom. It's about remembering who we are as free people. So... We drove around, this is somewhere in Treaty 6 territory, I don't remember, because a lot of it went by very quickly, and as you can see, I'm very happy at that time. <laughs> this was in uh, Satina, in Treaty 7 territory, just outside of Calgary. This was in their council chambers. A lot of those elders are gone now. I recognize they led their community in a lot of the discussion at that time. And one of the elders reminded me, he stood up and he said he went into the into the bush knowing that we were coming and he talked about these things and he said it's going to take a long time it might take a generation for us to unwind ourselves from from what we've experienced in the indian act system i was very blessed to have that experience from there i went to columbia because we are international people our nations go all over the world freely i went to columbia and that's at the northern tip of south america and I was made chief of this community. So whether or not I'm elected in an Indian Act election or elected as the grand chief of the PTO, doesn't matter because I'm always a, a chief in this community. <laughs> yeah. These are beautiful people. I know a lot of them are sick. And you know where that sickness comes from? Not having proper water. You know, and that's when I first learned about water and the importance of water and how scarce it is. And we take it for granted here that we have safe drinking water. But you know, these young people here, these beautiful young spirits, they don't have access to proper drinking water most of the time. And it leads to a lot of complications later on. It leads to conflict in family, in communities. Amongst the people of Colombia, there's conflict there. And you know, if you source it back, it's really about access to water. So I took that lesson and that teaching, and I walked for a couple dozen kilometers almost, <laughs> at the Tar Sands Healing Walk. With the people who are leading the charge here, and I know some of you are here right now, you know Jesse's sitting back there. I did that walk with the group because I believe that what we've been doing has been unsustainable, you know, in, in, our, in our homelands. And it's nothing against the good people that have to work in the industry, you know, to put bread and food on the table. You know, but we have to figure out new ways of being effective and new ways of building a new economy. Because if you're trading four barrels of fresh water for one barrel of oil, that's not sustainable. It's not a sustainable way to run an economy. So I did the tar sands walk, and that gave me what I needed to in order to be able to sit with people like Mr. Watson from the National Energy Board and ask questions like, if you're going to run new pipes from the tar sands to the coast to tidewater, as, as Mr. Carl would say it, what are you guys doing about the expansion of the footprint of the tar sands? What are you doing about the emissions into the air that the kids have to breathe into the future? And how do you measure the volumes put through there with what's being put out into the atmosphere for people to breathe? They had no answer. So how could I ever support the expansion of this if we don't know the consequences of the outcomes of the greenhouse gas emissions we're putting out there and the expansion efforts of our economy? So I took it upon myself, you know, with the mandate from the Chiefs of Manitoba to make sure that I got into this space and started to talk about it and share the message. Not because I'm trying to build myself up as a, as a chief, but because some people 
they carry messages and they're given messages and it's been my my pleasure and my honor to be to be able to do these things while I could. So I went to Morocco after that. I'm, I'm invited to these places, by the way. I'm just not jumping on a plane and flying all over the world you know, with my headdress on and asking people to talk to me. <laughs> Although that might be fun, um, I go only where I'm invited. And when people pass tobacco to me, I go to where they've asked me to go because that's how messengers work. You know, and, and no matter how important people try to think they are, or try to, or, or think somebody else is trying to be, it's really about just carrying a message when you're asked to. And you know, and sometimes those messages are really hard to come by, and ceremony people will understand that. I was invited to go to Morocco to the World Human Rights Forum, and I was invited to speak to the plenary, and there's literally thousands of people from all over the world there. You know, some of the big countries weren't there, like the U.S. wasn't there, uh, Canada wasn't there. Um, Canada wasn't there because they didn't want anybody to talk about the human rights record here at home. So I went there as an Anishinaabe, and I was able to talk about some of the things that we're experiencing. You know, but it was in Morocco where I recognized some of the value that we have here at home, that we can sit in a room like this and we can be critical of government and government action without fearing that they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna finish us off. You know, that, that's something that's valuable, I think, because I, I listen to speakers when I was in Morocco who can't even live in their home country because if they do, they'll be executed because of, of their beliefs and what they, what they have to say. So there's people living in England and France who had to fly into Morocco because they live right next door. Their family lives right next door, but they can't go home because of their beliefs. And that's where I realized how special of a time we have here, you know, whether it's Canada or whether it's the Hewak territory, Anishinaabe territory, we live in a special time where we can talk about these things without fear of being executed. And that's, that's something that I learned there. And you know, that's, this is a very, very difficult earned space because we fought for it. And we fought for it through a treaty. That's how the peace is still here, is through our treaty arrangements. So that was a very valuable teaching for me. I went to Wounded Knee <clears throat> around that time as well because I started to recognize the interconnectedness of things. And I began to understand that the, the trauma of one is the trauma of all of us. And that I think underlying premise of all of our interactions is the need to heal and to recognize and understand the trauma that we've all faced together. I went on that ride and when you go on that ride, they give you a name. And that name is what you take from the start of Chief Bigfoot's trek right to the Wounded Knee Massacre. That name is there because that was a person that made that trek and was executed you know, by the US military at that site. We're standing you know, right in front of a mass grave site right there. You know, and these people are still hurting because there was never any closure in the massacre that their families experienced. So, I wanted to raise that as well in terms of what we've learned along the way as Indigenous people, is that there's still a lot of closure that we need to work on. Next I went to New Zealand as well along the way. I went to Healing Our Spirits Worldwide in 2014 and had a chance to meet some very beautiful people, the Maori people of New Zealand. And while I was down there, they gave me a motorcycle to ride. And, um, the reason why that's important is because they wanted me to see that they're living in a police state. <laughs> the Maori people of New Zealand wanted me to experience that, so I did. I, I took the motorcycle, I went on the highway, and I was on the highway for about 15 minutes between Hamilton and Auckland, and I got pulled over by the, uh, by the police just because I, the guy said I looked like I was Maori. You know, and, and that's something that I took out of there, recognizing that we have a long way to go. You know, so people that are pushing the boundaries, you know, when we talk about cannabis, for example, they're the bravest of the brave people because we're challenging the fear that institutions have tried to instill in us to be fearful of who we are and fearful of participating in economics under our own terms. And that's still there. That's still happening. 
<clears throat> in my second last year of uh, being Grand Chief, I was asked to, by the Chiefs of Manitoba, I received a mandate to begin talking about what life might be like outside of the Indian Act. You know, and I um, jumped on my motorcycle again <laughs> with a handful of people and a busload of our young people and families. And we began trying to find our way back to who we were because I believe that that's the foundation of where we venture out into the economic world, is we start from the understanding of who we once were. The Treaty of Niagara was the first time that anybody said, for as long as the grass grows, the sun shines, and the river flows. That's where that term was coined. And it made its way into every successive treaty since then. So we went on that trek. We made strategic stops along the way to remind ourselves of who we were because the teachings that I received told me that even as far as here, people made the trek in 1763 to Niagara to be part of that message and to be part of that, uh, that teaching that was provided at that time about what national-based agreements are made of. And that's still true today. That's, what, that's what's here today still is a national-based treaty agreement international base. In 2017, I decided not to campaign anymore. And that was a very, very difficult time of my life because when I did that road to Niagara, a lot of people didn't like me. They thought that I was trying to be a national chief or something. They thought that I was aspiring for the next rung in the political ladder, which is the national chief. And that was never really the case, but people don't understand sometimes that sometimes people take on initiatives not for selfish reasons, but for selfless reasons, you know, and they, they, uh, they attack me pretty good, different, different spots along the way. And, um, you know, I decided at that point, I came home from Niagara, I jumped on a fishing boat in, in the northern tip of Vancouver Island, and I went fishing. And I realized at that point that, you know what, I'm going to be okay with me if I'm not the Grand Chief. And that's a tough realization that, you know, arriving at a place where you're going to be okay with yourself if you don't have a title. So I began to do the work necessary so that I don't have to campaign. I don't have to try and prove that I'm your best leader. And I said, I'm not campaigning. I'm not running for election. I'm not going to campaign. You know, the, the work I've done speaks for itself and I don't need to try and sell myself to anybody. So I declined, you know, uh, nominations for the, for the last AMC election in the summer of 2017. That's me and my outgoing speech. And I tried to have a discussion with the Chiefs about remembering who we are without titles. Because all this political hierarchy we've built, it hurts people. And it damages. And we have to heal from it. And uh, it may look like I'm crying, but I'm a, I'm a stoic guy. I don't cry. I don't cry. <laughs> water comes out of my eyes sometimes, but I'm not crying. It's <laughs> allergies or something. So. <clears throat> I transitioned out of politics. I declined nomination to the uh, Indian Affairs bureaucracy for my home community later that year because I was, I was nominated back home for chief as well. But the Indian Affairs uh, agent called me and said I had to affirm to them. And I said, no, I'm not affirming anything to you guys. And so my name fell off the ballot. So I didn't get, uh, I didn't get to compete or whatever you do now for, for elections. Moved into business. And I created Map Innovations. Um, we do everything that everybody else here says they do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say there's a lot of overlap, you know, with, with everything that everybody's trying to do. I'm not trying to be the best of the best in anything. I'm just trying to make ends meet, you know, and recognizing that the Canadian dollar that we all have in our pocket is a colonized dollar, all right? The value of that Canadian dollar, both here at home and internationally, is built on the backs of Indigenous people. And a lot of people didn't care anything about us or our communities until it was strategic for them to partner with us. So keep that in mind. You know, I recognize some of these uh, cannabis companies 
the other boards are full of RCMP, ex-RCMP or ex-judges and I thought, you know, one day they're putting us in jail, the next day they want to buy a steak dinner. <laughs> so, and I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, disrespectful, but I'm recognizing that strategic strategy is always used in a colonized economic environment. And we are a 100% indigenous owned company. You know, we don't, uh, we don't come into any place uninvited. We're not running around trying to get signatures from people to sign up with us for anything. But I'll let you know that we do pretty much everything that you guys do with a strong team. I have a <coughs> contracting relationship with BDO uh, out of Winnipeg. They provide tremendous capacity in band operations, <coughs> advisory services, technical support, you know, feasibility, business plan writing, everything. And it's a deep, deep capacity that goes right across the country. Um, I've also decided to work a little bit with an international firm called TCR Innovations. They're a group of CEOs around the world that have come together to try and get a handle on climate change. The guy I work with ran the Global Reporting Initiative, and um, he was one of the first ones to actually put together what's called the Carbon Credit. So we have a lot of capacity, you know, and we're not exploitive. We're not predatory in our approach, and I think that's what economic relations are supposed to be about amongst our nations. Um, so I don't go to a lot of the big events that are sponsored uh, by big industry. I stay away from that because um, I believe we've got to do our own inventory and start from the ground up instead of jumping into you know somebody else's big investment, you know, coming out of some big company somewhere. You know, and as I said, a lot of these Canadian dollars were made on the backs of, of dispossession and marginalization of our people. Because if you're like me, the only thing you brought from the reserve was, was your poverty. And uh, although I may be strategic today to, to partner with us, I, don't, I haven't forgotten about yesterday. You know, neither has my family. And that's kind of the principles we operate from. You know, in looking and working with some of our communities, I look at, at the holdings we have. In the last 20 years, there's been four and a half billion dollars of payments from Canada as settlement trusts. And when you look at what's being held in some of these settlement trusts, which I've had the, the, uh, the honor of being able to do, or the privilege of being able to do, I see where the money is going. Settlement trusts are being managed by Bay Street guys. You know, uh, they're not from our territories, they're not from our communities, but they're controlling your tens, your hundreds of millions of dollars. They're putting them in blue chip in the economic status quo, and they're forming a closed loop of that. So you're cut off from your, from your uh, trust, but you get a little bit of income from it. Your income comes out, and you share it, and you spend it on band operations, maybe you shore up you know, your band contribution funding with a little bit of that income. But for the most part, your money's being used to prop up the status quo. And I recognize that. Those investment managers, sometimes they work for the trust company, which sometimes ties itself to the big bank that you're invested in. So there's a bit of a conflict of interest in that type of uh, situation as well. And I just wanted to share that because that's something that we don't do. You know, we're looking at actually trying to help communities free up your working capital so you can actually invest in something that's meaningful for your community. And uh, that's what we're about at Mako Innovations, and I surround myself with people who are like-minded that way and thinking along the same way, because that's really how we're going to unlock the potential of our communities, is by working together from the ground up. We took a long time to get into the cannabis discussion because we saw what was going on um, out there. We were running around sponsoring events and get, trying to get communities to sign up. We took a long time to, to get involved because we didn't think that that would work very well. It might work to make some money, you know, for the big bands that have, you know, the, the big dollars to invest. But for the for the smaller communities that are looking for a, an entry point that's, you know, not going to take three, four, five million dollars, there's there's got to be an entry point for it. So we we started working with uh, with a guy out of Kelowna. His name's Bob Bob K. Um, He's the star of a show called Bud Empire, which is, I think, finished um, uh, filming his uh, second season of that. Uh, he's been a successful retail dispensary 
operator for the last decade or so. He's done very well for himself, and we wanted to learn from that capacity. Bob is an, an Indigenous guy, um, humble, uh, very good at what he does, very good at what he knows. He's well connected, you know, with many different growers from the from the unregulated marketplace. And what we've done is we've formed this, this uh, collective because we believe that there is an entry point for First Nations communities that don't have the big money. In building this concept, we start to look at what would it be to work from a sovereignty-based model? You know, because some communities don't, like I said, don't want to roll themselves over into the provincial or federal regulated regime. Some are going to want to you know, operate outside of that. And how do we respect that through a sovereignty model or sovereignty-based approach? And I heard a, a chief talk about it, and he said, you know, the starting point is growing. If you're, gonna, if you're going to provide anything for your community, you've got to be able to grow it. And I agreed with that. So our approach begins with looking at, at licensed or unlicensed cultivation, you know, depending on where the community wants to go, looking at processing, looking at testing, and then ultimately, you know, to finish off the vertically integrated chain, getting into a retail environment, dispensing from the community on your own terms. We believe within that closed loop, vertically integrated environment, we'll be able to perhaps withstand some of the market forces. They're going to eat up some of the other players that may not have created the efficiencies within their, their growing systems or their retail systems early on. Some of the early movers might get you know, consolidated, and that might be okay with them because some people aren't really in here for relationship building. They're in here to make money, and they're going to sell their equity as soon as they make enough money to justify moving to the next big thing. So I'd say keep that in mind as well. But uh, that's my presentation. I. Uh, I hope it's provided some value. I'm not trying to, you know, be provocative or, you know, try and be rude to anybody. But that's my perspective, I and mean, it's, it's been hard earned. I've been through a lot of trials and tribulations as, uh, as a chief. I've been stabbed in the back lots. I've been hurt by family, you know, and I'm, I'm in recovery from it still. You know, I do this work because I, uh, I love our people. I do honestly have a, an undying commitment. And, a, and an undying optimism that, that we are the original people, we are free, and we'll do the right thing you know, when the time is right for us. Miigwech, thank you very much.